American studies to have, have been collaborating on it with our friends and colleagues at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs. And I'd like to in particular thank uh, Alice for her support in terms of the arrangements to make this event possible. My name is Dr. Miriam Nighton Gray, I don't know if I already said that, and I am the Associate Director of Luxman Ireland House NYU and the Director of Graduate Studies for the Masters in Irish and Irish American Studies. Um, let me explain the format of this evening. We are going to run a short five minute video for those of you who are uninitiated or need a refresher as to the significance of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, it has been uh, produced by our colleagues at the Centre for Irish Studies in Liverpool and they're really delighted and honoured um, that we are sharing with it with you this evening. Then my myself and my colleague um, Professor uh, Tom Hill, who is the director of the Programme for Re Peace Research and Education in the SPS Centre for Global Affairs. Tom and I will tag team in asking Senator Mitchell some questions. And then we will open up for some questions in the audience if we have time. And um, I'd also like to invite you again, due to the generosity of the Irish Institute and the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, I would like it to invite you all back to Luxman Ireland House, which is across the park at 1 Washington Mews on Fifth Avenue. Um, you're more than welcome to come back and have a glass of wine and have a chat with us as well. So, um, before we roll our video, I'm going to call on the co-founder of Luxman Ireland House and the chair of our advisory board, uh, somebody who knows Senator Mitchell, um, I believe for a long period of time. I'm going to call on Loretta Brennan Luxman just to do some brief remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Um, Kieran Madden is here. <laughs> um, this is one of the best events we have uh, in a, an embarrassment of riches all through the years. And I would like to welcome some of the people to this wonderful event. Um, we have uh, Judith McGuire, who is the president of our advisory board at Glucksman Ireland House. Thanks for lots and lots from Judith. And Eileen Flannelly Mackle, who is the president of the Irish Institute. Eileen, where are you? <laughs> Looking gorgeous as always. And I cannot say Eileen Flannelly Mackle without saying daughter of the famous Adrian Flannelly. Uh, Kieran Madden, who's our wonderful council general in New York. And Geraldine Byrne Nason, who is representing Ireland at the United Nations. Um, yes, I have known S Senator Mitchell for quite a while and have been the beneficiary of watching him do seemingly impossible things, not just the Good Friday Agreement, but if you look at Senator Mitchell's track record as a public servant, as a jurist, as a person, he is um, impressive in ways that you just want to know him better. And for him and for his fabulous wife, Heather, that's a blessing and sometimes not so much because once you see George Mitchell in action, there is an urgency to get closer, to figure it out. How does he do that? How can he take a room full of, and I'm, I'm just not talking about Ireland right now. Um, George has been on some boards, and he has said this to me, some of those boards were a lot tougher than Northern Ireland ever was. <laughs> But George has this um, unique ability to have people come together to make common cause, which in this day of an age is highly valued skill. 
the fact that he dedicated so much of his talent, time, and personal life to our beloved country uh, shows the, um, the depth of his feeling, having grown up in an adopted home, but having some sort of umbilical to that wonderful country that we all treasure. Then when he answered President Clinton's request, um, the d dedication and the um, determination, some were saying stubbornness, but that's what it took. And this, I haven't seen this whole um, video, but I've seen several of the videos that have been done, including one wonderful one that I think is my favorite with Heather and the children when he, after he had gone, I think it was maybe just a couple years after you had gone, they all went back to Belfast and it's a documentary and it's very worth pulling up if you can possibly get it. We're here to listen to one of the wise men of our era one of the most um, respected and reasonable people in our society today. So with no further ado, I'll ask them to roll the video and then give you the wonderful gift of listening to Senator George Mitchell. Thank you very much. The tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering. We must never forget those who have died or been injured and their families. But we can best honour them through a fresh start. In which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust. And to the protection and vindication of the human rights of all. Whatever choice is freely exercised by a majority of the people of Northern Ireland, the power of the sovereign government with jurisdiction there shall be exercised with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all the people. We reaffirm our total and absolute commitment to exclusively democratic and peaceful means of resolving differences on political issues and our opposition to any use or threat of force by others for any political purpose, whether in regard to this agreement or otherwise. We acknowledge the substantial differences between our continuing and equally legitimate political aspirations. However, we will endeavour to strive in every practical way towards reconciliation and rapprochement within the framework of democratic and agreed arrangements. We pledge that we will, in good faith, work to ensure the success of each and every one of the arrangements to be established under this agreement. The parties affirm their commitment to the mutual respect, the civil rights, and the religious liberties of everyone in the community. Against the background of the recent history of communal conflict, the parties affirm in particular the right of free political thought, the right to freedom and expression of religion, the right to pursue democratically national and political aspirations, the right to seek constitutional change by peaceful and legitimate means, the right to freely choose one's place of residence, the right to equal opportunity in all social and economic activity, regardless of class, creed, disability, gender, 
or ethnicity. The right to freedom from sectarian harassment. And the right of women to full and equal political participation. It is recognized that victims have a right to remember as well as to contribute to a changed society. The achievement of a peaceful and just society would be the true memorial to the victims of violence. The participants particularly recognize that young people from areas affected by the Troubles face particular difficulties. The participants recognize and value the work being done by many organizations to develop reconciliation and mutual understanding and respect between and within communities and traditions in Northern Ireland and between North and South. And they see such work as having a vital role in consolidating peace and political agreement. An essential aspect of the reconciliation process is the promotion of a culture of tolerance at every level of society. Including initiative to facilitate and encourage integrated education and mixed housing. We will recognise the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland. To identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both. Accordingly, in the spirit of concord, we strongly commend this agreement to the people. North and South for their approval. Okay, are we live? You can hear me. My voice is pretty loud. My husband never complains about not being able to hear me. Um, Senator Mitchell, thank you again for um, agreeing. I know you've had a grueling uh, schedule in terms of your commitment to commemorating this milestone. And um, on behalf of us here at NYU, we're particularly delightful, delighted you're here today. Can I kick off by asking you, what was the logic behind the timing of Good Friday 1998? Was there a particular milestone in your head in that regard? Or can you give people just a little bit of background as to why the agreement happened when it precisely did? Yes. Uh, first, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Loretta, for your very kind and generous words. And I thank all of you for participating uh, in this moderating. Let me go back to the beginning of the talk. In June of 1996, uh, after a, a long and difficult process to get there, uh, the talks began in Belfast. Uh, for the first 18 months, uh, there was not only no progress, uh, there was invective, insult, uh, people walking out, people walking back, people walking around. Uh, I have said a lot of stupid things in my life. Uh, perhaps the most stupid was on the opening day of the talk. Having been in Northern Ireland for a year and a half, I was well aware that the political leaders not only had no history of talking together, listening to each other, but they affirmatively made a point of not listening, aggressively made a point of not hearing the other point of view. In an effort to reassure them, I naively said on the first day, I am a product of the United States Senate, where I served as the majority leader. The Senate, among its other unique rules, has a rule of unlimited debate, so any senator who wants to do so can stand up at any time and speak as long as he or she wants on any subject they choose, even if it bears no relationship to the legislation being considered. And so I said, I've listened to 16-hour speeches, 12-hour speeches, 8-hour speeches. I said, there's nothing you guys can say that I can't listen to. <laughs> <laughs> How I regretted that. Uh, <laughs> over the next year and a half as I listened to incredible repetition. I learned very early that the dramatic walkout is a standard tactic in Northern Ireland politics where you stand up and you yell at the other side and you insult them. And then when you finish with a loud flourish, you throw all your papers down 
and you walk out before they can respond. So for 18 months, I paid the price for that stupid statement, and I listened, and I listened, and there was very little progress. In December, a year and a half later, we met just before Christmas, and I held the hope, naive as it turned out, that we could at least get agreement on the issues to be resolved, not on the answers to the issues, just an identification, a single document that described what the issues were. And we worked hard, and then we got to the last day, and it fell apart. So the very last meeting before we broke for Christmas in 1997 was extremely difficult, a lot of uh, insults back and forth, trying to blame the other side. And, and I left to return to my home in New York for Christmas, which was about December 23rd, I think, in a very dejected mood. Four days later, December 27th, a very prominent Unionist paramilitary leader, Billy Wright, was murdered in prison by four nationalist prisoners. That touched off an intense round of tit-for-tat assassination. There had been ceasefires declared two years earlier, but they were never perfectly observed. Uh, there was sporadic but continuing violence on both sides, and in this case, the violence intensified dramatically. So. When we re reassembled after the new year, by prior agreement, the British and Irish governments trying to get some movement going thought a change of scene might help. Mm -hmm. So they agreed in advance that January would be spent in London and February in Dublin. But because of the exploding violence, the sessions in London and Dublin were extremely counterproductive. Uh, under the rules of the, that the talks are being held, anyone, any party affiliated with a paramilitary group, if that paramilitary group engaged in violence, the party would, would be evicted from the talks. And so in London, we expelled two of the loyalist paramilitary groups, and by the time we got to Dublin, uh, they wanted to expel Sinn Féin on the other side. So it was extremely acrimonious. When I left Dublin to fly back to New York for a brief break with my family in uh, mid-February, I concluded that these talks were nearly over, that the, uh, there was a spiral of violence that was accelerating. Attitudes were hardening. Uh, the invective was louder and more threatening. And I reached the conclusion that, although it didn't guarantee success, the only possibility was to set an early hard deadline, force a vote before the violence completely took over. And I, I took out a legal pad and I wrote out a schedule uh, of two weeks of intense talks uh, and, and a absolutely hard unbreakable deadline. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there were originally 10 political parties in the talks. Two had walked out for good, so there were now eight political parties and the two governments. And when I returned to Belfast uh, a week or so later, I started with the two governments and I went to the eight political parties to persuade them to accept this plan. In the course of Drafting the plan, I tried to think about when it would be best to do it. And I estimated that it would take me probably a month to get them all to agree. It's sort of like pick up sticks. There, you got eight parties and two governments, so 10 people. And you get the first one to agree, and the second one wants a change, so you have to go back to the first one. Then the third one wants to change it, back to the first and second one. It literally did take a month. Long days, nonstop meetings. So I figured we'd be through about, we could start in late March. And then knowing, of course, the history of Easter weekend in Irish history, mm -hmm. I arbitrarily selected 
uh, Thursday, Holy Thursday, midnight, as the deadline. I kind of felt we wouldn't make the deadline, but that gave us one day's cushion in case we didn't mm -hmm. succeed. And somewhat to my surprise, uh, uh, the government and the parties all agreed. There was quite a bit of resistance, uh, and it wasn't just words, it was substantive differences, but I was able finally to persuade them to accept it, and that is the first time I felt that there really might be a serious chance here, because any party, either of the governments or any of the eight political parties, could have refused to accept the deadline and therefore torpedoed the plan. But when they all agreed, I knew then that there was a chance. And that's how the deadline came about, and uh, thank goodness it worked out. I will say I established a subject and a target for every one of the 14 days, and until we got the agreement, we did not reach a single target. Wow. Every single day, we failed to meet the target. And it accelerated, but finally at the end, we were able to bring it all together, and uh, midnight came and went, but it was 17 hours later, at about five o'clock on Good Friday, that the agreement was reached. Can I ask you, Senator Mitchell, about your background in terms of um, your father was of Irish descent, but he didn't know he was of Irish descent because he had been adopted. You've spent so much time now in Northern Ireland and in Ireland, uh, the island of Ireland. Um, is there anything now that you look back with the benefit of hindsight and things like that? Are there traits about your father that were innately Irish? I suppose I'm asking a nature versus nurture question. And what, w what did you bring to the table in terms of your knowledge of Ireland prior to all this? Are you someone who had engaged with Irish history, et cetera, et cetera? Well, to start with the end, what did I bring to the table in terms of knowledge of Ireland? The answer is nothing. Uh, my father's parents were born in Ireland. They became part of the great human tide that left Ireland uh, seeking opportunity in the new world. Uh, millions came, and I'm sure that the history of a large number of people here is similar in some respects. Many succeeded, and uh, many failed. And my father's parents were among the latter. Uh, his mother died, his father couldn't care for children, so my father and his four siblings this is shortly after his birth, so he was an infant at the mm -hmm. time, uh, were dispersed to orphanages in the Boston area, where my father spent several years. He then was adopted by an elderly, childless couple from a small town in Maine who were not Irish. So my father grew up in a uh, very poor, working class, what we would think of as a slum, directly adjacent to a textile mill where it was filled with immigrants mostly French Canadian from Canada, but really the, the same mixture that exists that existed then and still does around much of America. My father had no education. He worked as a laborer, left school at the age of 10, and ended up as a janitor at a local school. My mother was an immigrant from Lebanon, uh, and she moved into that same area because an older sister had preceded her as an immigrant. My mother could not read or write. Uh, she spent 50 years working nights in the textile mill. My father learned of his Irish heritage from his older brother. Uh, one, he, my father ended up in the small town of Waterville, Maine. Another, one of his siblings ended up in Portland, Maine, Manchester, New Hampshire, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Wilmington, Delaware. And so it was some years my father was in his teens before he learned about his heritage and history. But he had no real knowledge of it. He had no education himself. I never heard him say the word Ireland. Uh, if you asked about Irish qualities, uh, he, he hardly spoke. He said very little. My father was a very quiet man, uh, even in anger. And he never, ever uh, discussed his upbringing or his childhood. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very painful mm -hmm. time for him. So the truth is, when President Clinton asked me, many years later, to go to Northern Ireland as his envoy, I had no real sense of my Irish heritage. I knew about my father, 
but I hadn't. I'd only been in Ireland once for a single day. Uh, as Senate Majority Leader, I had made a trip to the Balkans where I was somewhat involved in the conflict there. And the plane stopped at Shannon, and I, I took a day to just travel around a little bit in the Republic. I'd never been in Northern Ireland. So I have to say that people thank me all the time for what I did, but the truth is, it is I who should be grateful, and I am, because being able to go to Ireland, and after I did the uh, work on the peace process, I spent 10 years as a Chancellor of Queens, and I now go back quite often. I feel as though I have filled an inner void that I didn't even know existed, and that I have a sense about my father's Irish heritage. And I, I, I mean this sincerely, I, whenever I speak about this subject, I get a little emotional because I like to think he's up there looking down, experiencing some pleasure that his son mm -hmm. has had the opportunity to gain a sense of his heritage, which he never had. Can I, would, can I push you on, how does that work like Bill Clinton says, hey, George, I have this gig for you. I'm sending you to Northern Ireland. Or can you tell us a little bit about that uh, conversation? You know, uh, honestly, I, I feel I've been so fortunate. I've made so many friends, been treated so warmly uh, in Northern Ireland. Now, there was a lot of opposition to me when I first went. Mm -hmm. I had many, uh, uh, many critics. In fact, when the talks opened, I described this in my book, Prime Minister Bruton and Prime Minister Major came, it was at noon on June 10th, and they made very nice flowery speeches, and then they left, and then pandemonium broke out over whether I was fit to become the chairman of the talks. So for two days, literally two days, and almost through a whole night, I was in an adjacent room listening to a closed radio feed as these guys, most of whom I had met briefly in my previous time there, debated my fitness uh, for this position. So you can imagine what went through my mind, wondering what the heck am I doing here? Uh, and, 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 and the way the talks began, actually, was at 1.30 in the morning, a day and a half later, the British Secretary of State from Northern Ireland came into the room and said, we're going in. It sounded like an invasion of foreign territory. And we, I walked into the room, and it was absolute pandemonium. It was, it was a, a large square table with a hollow center. Uh, there were, at that time, 10 political parties, two governments, and a chairman, so 13 groups of people. Uh, probably 100 and all, half a dozen for each group. And on my right-hand side, uh, Dr. Paisley and the members of the, his party, the DUP, and a small party affiliated with them uh, were up chanting in unison, no, 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 no. And uh, when I walked in, there was a guy, I saw the chair and a big sign, chairman, but there was a guy sitting in the chair. <laughs> and of course, I didn't know who it was, so I walked over there, and it turned out he was a British civil servant. He said, well, I wanted to occupy the chair because we think that they might come and try to sit in it <laughs> and refuse to move and demand that they be arrested and cause a lot more controversy. So literally, literally, he kind of slid up and I slid down. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Paisley then, uh, after they stopped chanting no, before I could say a word, delivered an absolutely fiery denunciation of me very strong terms of describing my unfitness, my unsuitability, why I should go home. Uh, uh, and so that was my introduction. But typically, when they finished, they slammed their papers down, they walked out. So by now, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. So I, I wanted to establish some sense that the talks were going to proceed anyway. So I sort of made up a talk on the spot to the people who remained and tried to speak calmly about the objectives and what I hoped would happen, how I intended to conduct the proceedings. And we went on, I went on for probably 45 minutes or, or an hour. And then I adjourned until 11 o'clock that morning. I said, I, I want a demonstration that we're going to get this thing underway. We're going to continue. We're not going to have a long break. 
I then went out, and I called up Dr. Paisley, and the leader of the other party. It was 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I said to them, you've made your point. I understand and accept your opposition to me, but I'm now in the chair. The process is underway. The process is going to continue. And I think your interest, as well as the interests of the, of the discussion, would be advanced if you came back. So we're going to meet at 11, and I'm inviting you to return. You can say anything you want. You can say anything about me you want, but I think you should go back. And they both came back. And they stayed there for 16 months until Sinn Féin came in, and then they left for good. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, the first, that was the first day. And, and it went downhill from there. <laughs> so, uh, Senator Mitchell, first, very good to see you again. You too, Tom. Um, it, hopefully this is an appropriate uh, follow-up question to, to Miriam's, but in, in the book, Making Peace, you wrote that uh, your experience as chairman of the peace talks was, quote, the most difficult task I've under, ever undertaken far more demanding than the six years I served as majority leader of the United States Senate, but that the outcome of the process also was the most gratifying event of your public life. So I'm wondering if 20 years hence, both of those statements still hold true? And if so, can you tell us in retrospect whether you think there's anything you might have done that might have made them a little bit less difficult or possibly even more gratifying? Yes. Well, on the difficulty, uh, Loretta was the uh, Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade this past year. Well, very well deserved. <laughs> and uh, two years earlier, I had done it, and she called me up when they asked and said, what do you think about it? I said, well, the parade is fine. It's not a problem. I said, it's that you don't realize that for a month beforehand, you get to go to about 37 lunches, receptions, <laughs> dinners, and so forth. Well, at one of those functions two years ago, it was out in Queens, there was a very large crowd, and I said to them, uh, I'm about to say something to you that I never thought I would believe, let alone say publicly. And it is that when I left Northern Ireland, I thought it was by far the most difficult task I've ever undertaken. But then President Obama asked me to go to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And after six months with the Israelis and the Arabs, I thought the Irish were a bunch of patsies. <laughs> 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 they were really easy in comparison. Uh, and it turned out to be the case. So I, I amend that statement okay. from, in the okay. light of later events. Fair enough. Uh, as far as what could or could not have been done, uh, I think each of us is human, each of us is fallible, each of us makes mistakes every day. And I have no doubt uh, that along the way, I made some mistakes in judgment. Uh, but I think that uh, I conducted it in a manner that was intended to provide reassurance to the parties that it would be a fair, open, and constructive process. Uh, and on occasion, I may have uh, made misjudgments about on deciding things. But honestly, I think overall, it, it worked out pretty well. Uh, much later, after we got the agreement, about two years later, uh, I was asked by many reporters, well, you set a deadline and you got an agreement. Why didn't you set a deadline at the beginning and you could have saved everybody two years of <laughs> all this agony? Of course, the answer is that deadline is a one-time only process and uh, you have to call it at the right time. And I firmly believe that I, had I demanded a deadline a year earlier, there would have been no agreement. Uh, so I have a lot of regrets about the process, uh, I, I wrote in my book that my wife was very supportive uh, and she's an independent person. But when our, when our son was born, it became extremely difficult for me. Everybody who's a parent knows how your life changes when you get a child. 
and your obligations changed. So it was one thing for me to be in Northern Ireland when my wife was here by herself, but now I had a small child and I had a specific, the most important obligation of my life to my children. I, we were afraid I had a daughter. So it was, uh, that was a hard, hard time for me. And I, I, I never, well, I, I never have before or since felt that I've mastered the right balance there. It's a very difficult one when you already said I do a lot of events and I do a lot of events. I spent seven days, eight days last week in Dublin, Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK. But you try the best you can to balance it. That's probably for me the most difficult part of it, achieving the right balance between family obligations and work obligations. Thank you. <clears throat> and Referencing your, your trip last week, you said, well, you were in, um, I believe, in, in uh, Northern Ireland at the time, that the agreement did not purport to be a solution to all problems for all time in Northern Ireland, and that it was, quote, a compromise that represented the best that could be done at the time. So I'm wondering, you know, really from a, both an academic and a policymaking perspective, if, if that's the case, what should we learn about the limitations of political peacemaking? Um, and the need for other forms of peace building after violent conflict has ended. When I announced the agreement, I described it as an historic achievement, which I believe it was. But I also said on that same day, April 10th, and then again in interviews on April 11th, that by itself the agreement did not guarantee peace or political stability or reconciliation. It made them possible. But it did not, even by its own terms, purport to resolve every problem that existed in the society of Northern Ireland. Indeed, we created commissions to deal with problems in the future that we didn't resolve. And it was a political compromise, imperfect. But the central prerequisite for a peaceful democratic society is the absence of political violence. Mm -hmm. When the, many of you are very familiar with the situation on that, I'm sure there are people here who are from there. And it was truly striking to me, and I, I was there, remember, remember, the talk started a year and a half after I first got to Northern Ireland, and I went back after the assembly collapsed in 1999 for a third, uh, third negotiation that I chaired. But uh, the, the heavily attended, highly emotional weekend funeral with a great deal of grief and sorrow and intense demand for revenge is a part of life. And it really wasn't possible to think about doing the ordinary things in a democratic society that people do while you have this overlay of physical violence. Interestingly, some analysts have des described the number of deaths as not that large in comparison to other conflicts in the Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere, and that's true. But what they overlook is that uh, there, there was a culture of beating and maiming, permanently crippling people, which affected an unknown number, certainly a, a many times multiple of the 3,600 3, who were killed. Mm -hmm. That's a very shocking thing when you confronted it, as I had. Uh, uh, the kneecapping was invented in Northern Ireland, permanently mm -hmm. crippling people. And the, the beatings which resulted in people being maimed, some of whom were still alive, many of whom I had visited with and met with. So it created an overlay of fear and anxiety that made normal life impossible. So the, the great achievement of the Good Friday Agreement was so far, at least, thank God, has eliminated the political violence, which has removed that huge cloud of fear that hung over everyone and permitted the normal institutions to come forward. When I was in Northern Ireland last week, there, I, I said to them, self-criticism is a healthy thing for individuals and for society. In fact, one of the great things about American society, and it's at the same time troubling, that we, all of our problems are right out there in the open, debated vigorously, exaggerated, uh, and so forth. 
But like every other virtue, self-criticism, when carried to an excess, can be crippling and debilitating to an individual and to a society. And in Northern Ireland, there's too much, too intense, too consistent self-criticism and an underestimating of their own strength mm -hmm. and abilities. And I think that the, 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 the fact that there has been that political violence has been enabled a, a flourishing, although not at the pace not as completely as anyone would like. I was asked repeatedly while I was there, well, is it just terrible? The schools are not integrated. It's still a segregated community. People still lead separate lives. My answer is yes, that's true. But that will come in time. Mm -hmm. I just conclude this answer with one anecdote. In the Balkans, uh, I visited a, a, a small city in Bosnia, just along the Croatian border. Before the war there started, it was half Serb, half Croat. When the war started, the Serb militia approached. The Serbs in the town joined with them, took control, and in, in, in a necessary act of vengeance, they burned virtually every building in the town owned by Croats. 18 months later, the tide of war changed. The reverse occurred. Mm. By the time I got there, I was the center majority leader. Doing, meeting with the leaders of those countries and visiting and trying to help. Uh, practically every building had been damaged, most of them destroyed. And so I said to the mayor, a thoughtful young guy, I said, how long do you think it's going to be before Serbs and Croats can again live side by side in peace? And he thought for quite a while and he said, uh, we will rebuild our institutions, we will repair our bridges long before we repair our souls. <coughs> the hardest and yet the most important thing is what's in people's hearts and minds. It's very hard for people who have suffered direct personal loss in the conflict mm -hmm. to forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. right. And you, you, you can't judge a person's grief. We have, I have no moral basis to say to someone, yeah, you gotta forget it. They don't forget it. They shouldn't forget it. And so for them, it comes very hard. History tells us that over time, with the passing of people who had direct loss in it, uh, with integration of the schools, with the breakdown of the other barriers that exist, uh, I think it will, reconciliation will come. And I believe that to be the case. It may not be in my lifetime. I think it will be in my children's lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's my great hope and prayer. Thank you. Well, uh, along those lines, um, you know, one of the other things that I heard you say last week that clearly you think Northern Ireland is a, quote, very much different and better place than it was 25 years ago. And yet, as you point out, there, there's, there's complexity to the situation right now. Um, I think the Northern Ireland Peace Monitoring Report uh, has pointed out that 83% of people in Northern Ireland now, quote, feel a sense of belonging, which is remarkable considering mm -hmm. the fact that Northern Ireland is a much more multi-ethnic place than it was two decades ago. But at the same time, as you said, um, mixed housing that was a goal of the agreement has not happened yet. Only 7% of children in Northern Ireland are in integrated schools. Mm -hmm. So what is it you see today that gives you that hope that you just, um, you know, spoke about that, that that reconciliation will come. Um, as you said, maybe not in our lifetimes, maybe in our, maybe in our children's. Well, let me come at it from two perspectives. Yeah. First, when I landed in Dublin about uh, 10, 12 days ago, and then again when I got to Belfast, I did many, many television interviews. And almost everyone asked me, oh, isn't this terrible in Northern Ireland? Look at this political dysfunction, the government's not working, and so forth. Isn't that terrible? I said, well, I just got off the plane from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I said, is there any American who has the right to preach to someone else about political dysfunction? And, and, and one of them, a guy standing next to me was a British government official. I said, this guy just came from one. I said, they got problems of their own, too. We, we, we should hold North Island to a high standard, but not to a standard that doesn't apply anywhere else. There, there are powerful social economic forces sweeping the world today. 
and virtually every society is confronting some degree of change and upheaval. In Africa and the Middle East, it's expressing itself in widespread violence and upheaval. In our societies, it's producing uh, a great deal of political discord. And we, we can't expect any democratic society, any society, uh, to escape those trends. Secondly, I believe that because human life individually and in groups involves change, that the seeds, the solution to every human problem contains within itself the seeds of a new problem. And so you deal with one issue and then you move along and then another issue comes up and you deal with that and it comes up. So there, there, is, there, there is an attitude on the part of some critics in the UK and Northern Ireland that, well, the agreement is over with. It, it, in other words, it was intended to solve all these problems and they haven't been solved, so therefore the agreement hasn't worked. Well, I don't think that's the way life works. And I don't think that's the way societies work. And so, yes, there are problems and, and they have to be, they can't be minimized or swept under the rug. They have to be confronted, but they, they should be confronted in a way that I tried to approach the talks amidst all of the difficulty and all of the negativism and the many no, no, no's, you keep moving forward, looking for hope, looking for opportunity, trying to figure out ways to bring people together. And if you listen carefully enough, sooner or later you, you hear, see, or read something that suggests, well, maybe there's a possibility here. And I believe that the powerful force of economics will generate school integration. You go around rural island and you see rural, uh, rural northern island, you see half empty schools and communities. You know very well sooner or later they're going to figure out we've got to put them all in one school. Mm -hmm. and, and it's going to take a while, but, but I think that's going to happen. And I, I have to say this though. I talked about the passing of people who have been through the conflict. That is a very powerful social force. But there is another competing social force that arises, and it's a challenge to any society to find the right balance, and that is that as, you, as violence becomes a memory, it doesn't ha generate the same fear in young people who've never experienced it. Mm -hmm. To those in North Rand who lived through the violence, especially those who suffer directly from it, not for a moment do they want to go back to it. There are a couple of very tiny fringe elements on both sides, but the overwhelming majority, they've lived through it. They, they can't even contemplate going back to it. But to a young person who holds passionate political views and thinks that as we all do, his or her side is right. By, well, well, that's back in history. That's sort of like the pyramids of the Second World War or something. They, they don't remember. It. And so it's, it's, it is these two forces, these two social forces and attitudes will be competing for the loyalty of the people of Northern Ireland for quite a while to come. And, and I, I think it's going to turn out well but no one can be assured, and no society is immune from violence. We, we think, we, we, we're Americans, we're very proud of our country, and this is a truly great country. But let's not forget, uh, in, in the 19, early, late 20s and early 30s, one out of four Americans was unemployed. A group of a couple thousand veterans of the First World War who had risked their lives for their country gathered in Washington in a peaceful protest because they were destitute, they couldn't get jobs, they served their countries, and it was broken up by force. They were arrested, expelled from the ball, uh, our country. Uh, and so nobody's immune from it. Uh, and the, the leadership has to be strong and I think positive in trying to find what unites people rather than exploiting what divides them. And as I said, who are we Americans to tell others about that right now? Thank you. Right. Senator Mitchell, can I ask you, I mean, it's kind of a follow-on to what you were just talking about. 
President Clinton has observed that the current political paralysis in Northern Ireland is dangerous. I mean, to what extent would you agree with that assertion? And do you think a US envoy would help in breaking that paralysis? Yeah. Well, I was sitting there when he said that statement. Okay. Uh, it was at Queen's University uh, uh, a week ago today. Mm -hmm. And uh, President Clinton, Prime Minister Blair, Prime Minister Hearn and I were seated on the stage. And seated in the audience were the leaders of the Democratic Unionist Party and Sinn Féin. And they were actually sitting in the same row, the second row, but they weren't sitting next to each other. And so the President Clinton said, which I thought was a, an appropriate statement, he said, this is a dangerous situation. He said, I notice you're sitting in the same row, but you're not sitting next to each other. He said, we all got to get together and help them sit together next to each other and try to resolve this issue. And I believe they can. I, I don't minimize the differences that they have. But in comparison to the issues that were faced in 1998 by their predecessors, in my remarks to them, I said to them, look back 20 years and see what they confronted. And they confronted it in the time of great violence and threat of violence that doesn't exist now. And certainly these political leaders ought to be able to resolve this issue. And I, I, I hope and pray that they will, and I hope that the the events of last week and events like this in our country and theirs will, will generate a spark among these leaders to try to figure out a way to, to get the assembly back up and running mm -hmm. so that democratic, nonviolent means, public, vigorous public debate is the way to resolve their issues. And on a peace envoy from the states? Well, it, I don't believe there is any absolute rule uh, about uh, the value or lack of value of outside uh, intervention in any form. I think it's like technology neutral. It can be used appropriately for some circumstances and but for negative ends in other circumstances. I think that's a decision for the people of Northern Ireland and the UK and Irish governments to make. I think more important than the existence of an envoy is our attitude as Americans. Uh, I'm asked often, you know, what can I do? Well, I say to them, every person in this room can be a peacemaker. Every single person. While the conflict in Northern Ireland and many others is not exclusively or even primarily economic, it involves differences in religion, national identity, territory. Underlying all of it is an economic factor. Of that, there can be no doubt. And that's true of every conflict. On the very first day I was in Northern Ireland, first day I set foot there, arrangements had been made for me to go to the peace line, the ugly wall that divides mm -hmm. the two communities of Belfast to meet with each side, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. They were very powerful, instructive meetings. In the afternoon session on the unionist side, a, a Protestant minister, Jackie Redpath, I think many of you, some of you here may know Jackie, just a tremendous, great man, made one of the most powerful orations I've ever heard anywhere, and I've heard a lot of orations. He brought with him two maps. And one of them was titled Unemployment in the Urban Areas of Northern Ireland with color coding it showed the areas of higher employment. Then the other one was titled Violence in the Urban Areas. He tacked it up, but of course you're not surprised to hear that they fit like a hand in a glove. Mm -hmm. Where people don't have hope, where they don't have opportunity, where they don't have jobs, where they can't get self-esteem. But one of the great driving forces in life, self-esteem and self-respect, then they're much more likely to resort to or to be susceptible to calls for violence and extreme action. So we have to, as, as, as a government and as a people, commit ourselves to continuing our interest in Northern Ireland, those who care about it, to engage in trade and commerce, to visit, 
to make it clear to them that the American people care about what's happening there. Mm -hmm. And we want to help and support them, and we're going to do it in whatever small way we can. And our government and the government of the UK, and I said this in London as well, have to avoid any decisions that would adversely affect the economy of Northern Ireland. Because if you have a sudden sharp increase in unemployment rate, you make it more difficult for the political leaders to have room to function. People all want the same thing. It's how they define it. In the five years I was there in the peace process, I never met a single person who said to me, I don't want peace. Mm -hmm. Nobody's, nobody wanted conflict. But then I'd say to them, well, what do you want? I want peace. On what terms? Our terms. And our terms means the other side should give in because we're right and they're wrong. And you have to break through that and get to the point. It was F.D. de Klerk, I believe, who said in a very accurate statement when asked about negotiating the process in South Africa. Mm -hmm. He said the hard part is not sitting across the table from your adversary and negotiating a principled compromise. The hard part is when you take that agreement back to your community and you say, this is a good deal even though we're not going to get 100% of what we want. Because as sure as can be, someone's going to stand up and say, it's not good enough. We want more. We gave up too much. Uh, always those in such situations who will criticize any form of compromise as claiming it doesn't get enough. That's the real challenge. That's the challenge that the leaders face now. And that's what takes strength and fortitude mm -hmm. and a commitment to the well-being of the whole society, not just those that you immediately represent. Senator Mitchell, do you think that now is a time to discuss um, a referendum on Irish unity? Well, that's a decision that will be made uh, under the agreement and law mm -hmm. by the British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And the uh, Secretary of State's office there has published an analysis of it in which they conclude that the, the timing is, the terms on which it would be based do not exist. Mm -hmm. That the, it's essentially the standard, I'm, I'm, I don't have the exact legal words, so I'm paraphrasing, are that when there is any indication or some substantial indication, I don't remember the exact words, that the people of Northern Ireland wish to change the political status, then a referendum will be called. And the Secretary of State's office <laughs> cites a large number of polls and other indicators that uh, uh, suggest that uh, a, a, a now, as was the case 20 years ago, uh, it is clear that a, a substantial majority of people in Northern Ireland would not want to change the political status. And question. Now, those who favor a poll uh, make an argument that uh, the British government has somehow violated the terms of the uh, Good Friday Agreement doesn't adequately represent both sides. I have not heard that argument or read that argument explored in full. I've had it orally made to me briefly. But the decision under law is, is within the power of the British Secretary of State, and it's pretty clear that they, that they now, if, at least for now, have concluded that it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there, there is no basis for calling it. Okay. Uh, Senator Mitchell, so as you've mentioned, uh, certainly there are a lot of people right now talking about the challenges to the, to the Good Friday Agreement 20 years hence, at the same, same time as so many of us are celebrating it. Um, I'm wondering whether, when you look at it, um, given all the challenges, whether you can still um, really see whether there's something that we should take out of it. Now, of course, 50% of most uh, peace agreements fail within five years. So one of the reasons we're here having this discussion is that it's 20 years hence, and despite all of the challenges, the agreement is in force. Um, is there something for future peacemaking efforts uh, that we should learn from this? Again, as academics, as policymakers, 
or do you look at this as a moment in time where you were uh, obviously one of the most significant actors, where that was a particular dynamic that could not be repeated? Or is there really something that could be applied to other cases? I think that every human being is different. There are seven and a half billion people in the world, and there's no one exactly like you, or like you, or like me, or like anybody else in the room. And I think that's true of societies and cultures as well. Uh, I, having now been involved deeply in three such conflicts, in Northern Ireland, the Balkans, and the Middle East, uh, while there are similarities, uh, the historical, cultural, social and political histories are all quite different. And I think any solution must be unique to the specific circumstances that exist there. That's the first point. The second point is it has to be an agreement of and by the people who are affected. I mentioned earlier that on my first day I said a very stupid thing about the filibuster. I also said something that I think contributed to the end result. I said to the delegates, I do not come here with an American peace plan. There is no Clinton plan. There is no Mitchell plan. If we ever get agreement, it will be your plan. Because it is you who will have to live with the consequences, not me or not President Clinton. And two years later, when I participated in the drafting of the agreement, we made certain that every single word in that document was spoken or written by someone from Northern Ireland. Every single word. And in fact, on the last day, April 10th in the morning, when I distributed the final, final version to the eight political parties seeking their approval, I put a covering letter on it. And I reminded them what I'd said two years earlier, and I said that to them, this is your agreement. That's, the, in my judgment, a, a, an essential prerequisite to getting agreements that can be sustained. Because they're the ones who said it, they're the ones who wrote it, they're the ones who signed it, and they're the ones who live under it. That's absolutely essential. Outsiders can help, can play a role, but in the end it's their, it's their decision. The third point, no agreement. No political agreement is intended to solve all problems for all time. Is there a more substantial, important, lasting political agreement than the United States Constitution? One of the great, not only political, but literary achievements in all of human history. And yet, almost from the beginning, it was changed in very powerful and significant ways. The first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, are essential in our society. So no one should think of the Good Friday Agreement as somehow being written in stone and can never be changed. And fourth, to be specific, there, there is a real, an important part and a challenge in the document itself. I believe that the twin pillars of democracy are first, the majority rules. You have a free, fair, and open election, and whoever gets the most votes wins, except for our electoral college system. <laughs> <laughs> and they vindicate the rights of the majority. However, Essential to democracy is the protection of the rights of minorities, those who didn't win the election, or who didn't participate in the election, or are minorities in some other way. And that's the genius of our system and the challenge of our system. The majority rules, but if the Congress voted unanimously, and the president signed in a law that said you can't practice your religion, it has no legal effect. Because the rights set forth in the Bill of Rights cannot be overridden by a majority. Now, in Northern Ireland, we had to moderate the principle of majority rule to permit minority rights, because that was the essence 
of the, of the challenge. So we set up a power sharing government which establishes a mechanism in which legislation, certain important legislation, is required to have not just a majority, but three majorities. An overall majority, a majority of the majority, and a majority of the minority. There are some political scientists who argue that dilutes it too much the other way. And there may come a time when the people of Northern Ireland want to alter that. That's their judgment to make. It, w it was intended to meet a need, a specific need at a specific time in history, a mechanism to give everybody a sense of belonging, which your poll number suggests does exist, and to end political violence. And if there should be changes in it, that's up to the people of Northern Ireland, just as up to we Americans to make decisions on what we think should be changed here, or the people in the Republic of Ireland to change whatever they, and we're in constant change here. Just look at all of the constitutional amendments that we've had, the dramatic changes in, in our society, most of it to the better. Just, just I don't want to equate Northern Ireland to the United States, but just an example of what happens in societies. When the Constitution was approved, great document as it is, it specifically condoned slavery. The only people who could vote were adult white men who owned property. And of course, those changed over time. It took the bloodiest war in our history to end slavery. And then we had over a century of really state-sponsored discrimination, which maintained the discriminatory practices of slavery in a different context in a way that engendered discrimination. And it took 60 years of political struggle to get the right to vote for women. Seems so fantastic now. It seems almost unimaginable to us that it could be such a political struggle that it took more than a half century. It wasn't until I was in the Senate and I had said majority to push the Americans with Disabilities Act for the first time in history we recognize the right of people who are disabled to live a full and independent life. Not until 1991. And now we've gone through the whole issue of sexual uh, differences, the, 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 the right of anyone to marry whoever they love, whatever their gender. That's a, that's a dramatic revolution in human history. So look at all the changes in our society, and you look at Northern Ireland and say, they'll go through some of the same challenges. There'll be ups and downs. There'll be huge political fights. The key is they're going to resolve them through democratic and peaceful means, not through political violence. And that's the lasting achievement of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you. So, just to follow that up briefly, you, you referenced earlier your work in the Middle East that followed your, your work in Northern Ireland. And I'm wondering whether you, what you accomplished in Northern Ireland was an advantage to you going to the Middle East, given your own experience and what people knew of you, or whether it worked against you? Well, no, I think it was helpful. Uh, and I think Northern Ireland does stand as an example. I don't think we in the United States appreciate the extent to which people from all over the world go to Northern Ireland, see Northern Ireland as an example of what is possible, and look to it for some degree of inspiration, mostly in just demonstrating that it really can happen. Uh, it isn't impossible, as many people think. They're not locked in endless uh, combat. Uh, but obviously that was uh, that didn't change the factors in the, in the Middle East where it, it is a much more complicated situation. First off, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is debated, discussed, and viewed by many Americans in relative isolation. But it is profoundly impacted, and in turn it impacts events in the immediate area. It's a huge, huge challenge. Uh, Islam is undergoing severe stress. Uh, the internal divisions, some ancient, like the Sunni-Shia split, which 
with a political struggle on the death of the Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago, not a religious difference, uh, up to very recent uh, iterations, uh, uh, smaller groups, sects, some promoting aggressive violence. Uh, and there are many, many other factors in the Middle East, so uh, I, I think it made, it made it less likely, although I, I spoke at a conference in Washington last night on the Middle East, and I expressed my view that I, I think they are going to come around because I believe that societies like individuals ultimately act out of self-interest. It takes sometimes a while to figure out your self-interest, and many people make mistakes of judgment in assessing what their self-interest is. Uh, but I think that ultimately, they, both sides, they will come to see that for all of the pain that would accompany an agreement, and it would be very painful for both sides, uh, they're better off with an agreement than without, a, without one. And that, I think, is the, ultimately the calculation that will be made. And I hope it's, I hope it's sooner, if not later, because it would be a, a shame if there's continued widespread violence and deaths uh, before there is a reason settlement. Thank you. Senator Mitchell, you kind of answered this question earlier, um, and I just want to kind of as a concluding question, um, you, so you, you think the role that Irish America or Americans more generally can play in Northern Ireland is by demonstrating their interest by physically going there and engaging with it. You think that matters on the ground? It matters tremendously. It really does. Everybody loves to be loved. And they want to know that we still think about them, that we care about them, that we're concerned about their concerns. And uh, an envoy is one way to do it. I'm not against it. It's up to them to decide and for our government to decide. But there are other tangible ways that it can be done. There are business people in this audience. You're not going to find a more productive group of workers, people energetic, educated, uh, very successful uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, if there's something that people feel that it's a good springboard to the uh, European Union, that's now a whole separate issue that we haven't discussed. That was much discussed last week. Uh, that's, that's a real challenge. But uh, I, I, I think there are solid, practical, economic, and certainly uh, peace reasons to continue. I go there as much as I can. I talk it up wherever I can. I, whenever a Northern Ireland business opens here, I try to go to the, cut the ribbon and uh, vice versa. I think we can all do our bit if we just focus on it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm conscious of time and I think that we um, maybe will defer, we won't open it up to the audience unless someone really has a pressing question. Um, on behalf of Luxman Ireland House and the Centre for Global Affairs, um, can we extend a warm um, round of applause to Senator Mitchell? schedule over the last few weeks and we're we are just to reiterate how grateful we are that he has stopped close to home at NYU and everybody is welcome back to Luxman Ireland House uh, to have a glass of wine and to just uh, reflect on the fantastic insights we've heard this evening thank you ladies and gentlemen and thank you again Senator Mitchell. thanks Tom. Thank you.